Thank you, Bill. <coughs> uh, winding up the uh, six uh, initial uh, talks here is Professor Hadley Arkes. Uh, Hadley is, uh, is a, the Edward Ney Professor of Jurisprudence in American Institutions at Amherst College. Uh, I've known him since the days when he was a Salvatore Fellow. He's one of the uh, very profound writers on a variety of subjects, including the one that we're dealing with today. Uh, please welcome Hanley Arcus. Bill Eskridge reminds me of um, Mark Twain's line from Puddinghead Wilson's calendar that Adam ate the apple, not because he wanted the apple, because it was forbidden. And the great mistake was not forbidding the serpent. Then he would have eaten the serpent. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I find myself in a position where I'm probably one of seven people here who think Lochner was rightly decided. And I'm... Um, and I have to play the role of the moralist here. And it's, it was that line from Tom Stoppard that the moralist is bound to sound like a crank haranguing the bus queue with the demented certitude of one possessed of privileged information. <laughs> uh, but I did, I said something awkward. Um, I have prepared something that addressed the subject we're given. <laughs> and uh, so I may have to use an old device of mine and compress this talk hebraically by omitting the vowels. <laughs> I'm time for seven minutes, Ed. Um, I understood that the problem here at the core was the question of whether government should shape the culture. And it's curious as to how people affect to be unaware of the classic understanding of the connection between the logic of morals and the logic of law, and then find themselves persistently backing into the same logic and indeed relying on it at every turn. Of course, the government shapes the culture. It shapes our moral understanding because that was built into the very nature of lo and logic of law. When we legislate, we override claims of personal choice and private freedom, replace them with a uniform rule and a public obligation, and that move is coherent only as we appeal to some principle that defines what is just or unjust, more generally or universally. So forgive me for being clinical, but when we move to the level of a moral judgment, we move away from statements of merely personal preference or private taste. We begin to speak about the things that are right or wrong or unjust for others as well as ourselves. And so if we come to the judgment that it is wrong to own humans as slaves, we mean it would be wrong for everyone, for anyone. And if we come to the judgment that it's wrong for parents to torture their infants, the logical response is not to say, ah, therefore let's give a, a tax incentive to induce them to stop. <laughs> the logical response is with, is with the voice of a command, a command that forbids that torture to whom? To anyone, to everyone. We forbid it with the force of law. That's not to say that, that it's wise to reach with the law everything that is wrong, because we may hold back in prudence. But the law finds its ground of coherence and its ground of justification only when the moral ground and principle has been established. So when we restrict the freedom of people, we're obliged to say more than most of us don't like it. That's not good enough. And to get clear on the moral standards that must govern our judgment is not to legislate more, it is to legislate less. We raise the bar. That's why I, too, think we have too much law. And so when the question was raised in the past, how does the law teach? How does it go out gauge in moral teaching? The answer was, it teaches through the laws. When we legislate against racial discrimination in private inns and restaurants, we remove that discrimination from the domain of private taste and treat it as a matter of moral consequence. Between 1963 and 1966, opinion in the South came to be parallel with opinion in the North, with majorities in both sections holding to the wrongness of racial discrimination. We may ask, did the culture of the South change so strikingly in three years? Or did it have something to do with new moral lessons being taught at the top of the state and taught dramatically with the laws? In recent years, the most dramatic attempts to alter the culture, to shape anew the moral understanding, has come through the efforts to impose through the courts a right to abortion and the notion of gay rights, including same-sex marriage. And clearly, those issues stand at the core of what we call the, today the culture wars. In these cases, the project was to instruct the public gradually, persistently, that the things that elicited a public recoil should now be tolerated, then accepted, then approved, then regarded as rightful, desirable, as things to be promoted through the use of the laws. Now, in Massachusetts, we have seen the move to teach even more emphatically in the schools to proclaim in the land 
The new ethic contained in the orders of the court on same-sex marriage. Now, some administrators have declared it is now, after all, the law. And they are teaching the pupils to understand the moral lessons that the law is trying to impart. Surely the most risable thing these days is to hear both proponents of same-sex marriage and even libertarians profess to be appalled at the notion of using the law to reshape the culture, the moral understanding of the public. No one can rightly deny that the, the law imparts a sense of what is rightful and wrongful. The libertarians would have us recede precisely because they wish to recede from moral judgment on certain things, perhaps racial discrimination or sexual matters. But even the libertarians are not willing to overthrow the laws on marriage. They insist that the laws require two parties competent to contract, not the marriage of children or the marriage across species that some people have recently sought. Maybe Mr. Philip Bubel in Maine wanting to marry his 37-pound dog lady. Yet even if our libertarian friends are right, and the libertarians are right 80% of the time, uh, you know, what was Holmes' line about Rufus Beckham? He said his major premise was, God damn it. <laughs> and, and as the social scientists say, it explains a large portion of the variance. He got it right most of the time. Uh, even the libertarians do wish to instruct people in the moral rightness of a government that restrains itself and respects personal freedom. The point here is that nothing here can be settled by invoking some empty slogan that the law should not try to shape morality. The law has no business speaking in the first place unless it's pronouncing on something of moral consequence. If we think it's seriously wrong for a parent to withhold medical care from a child, we're moved to have the law register a concern and intervene. There used to be signs saying, no Irish need apply, white tenants only. They did not necessarily produce material harms. They denigrated, they produced a time certain emotional wounding. Yet the law came down to bar those kinds of signs, even when the law had not barred the freedom to engage in the discrimination in hiring or renting. Stephen Douglas famously insisted that the government should not pronounce on the vexing moral questions like slavery, people should be left to their personal choice, but when it was a matter of polygamy now in Utah, well then he was willing to send in the troops. Because now this was serious stuff. <laughs> and thus it is. If people take seriously a right to abortion, they want to see it protected and promoted in the law. They're not content with a federalist solution, for they're not content with the notion of people, that people may be deprived of a right because they happen to live in South Dakota rather than New York. And the party that professes such a deep concern about privacy has led the charge over the years in withholding the shelter of privacy for private business, private clubs, respecting their own private criteria. In the case of gay rights, there's been an adamant opposition even to tolerating the right of people in their private enclaves, in their small businesses, or rental of homes, to honor their own moral convictions or the, on the rightness or wrongness of homosexuality. And surely this would seem to be the place where the claims of private judgment could have been readily tolerated by people who've made privacy their anchoring slogan. And this doesn't even get us to the clamor for new measures on hate speech to censure and punish even priests who might state the traditional teachings on homosexuality. As Lincoln said, if slavery were right, all words against it would be wrong and could rightly be swept aside. And I could grant your request to censor the federal mails to screen out the abolitionist literature. And so we could grant this point. If the people professing this, professing this new ethic on same-sex marriage happen to be right, well, the course they've taken is quite warranted. But that is the substantive question. And that is the question in which everything must finally hinge, not some cliché about the law not shaping the culture. And so, like that character in Moliere, who <coughs> discovers that he's been speaking prose all his life, some of our friends, wringing their hands over the sh law shaping morality, find that they've been doing precisely that at every turn.